a bit more than six years uh, experience with Java. Uh, my current project uh, is in the healthcare domain. And uh, the current presentation is fully based on my current project that we have been developing for more than 1.5 years. We have developing it uh, from the scratch. So all those decisions we made uh, by, by ourselves. And uh, uh, we'll have a demo. And in that demo is like fully based on uh, our real project. So um, let's go to our agenda. Uh, so first, uh, we'll uh, talk about the problem. What uh, what problem do we have? How can we solve it? And then we'll have a demo. Demo is the biggest part of this presentation. Uh, so um, uh, next we'll have some more theory, but uh, the presentation in most is mostly consist of uh, of the demo and that. Uh, the project, so uh, don't expect much theory in this presentation, but uh, I'll leave you some additional materials. And if you are interested, uh, you will have a chance to uh, to go deeper with this. Uh, then we will have conclusion and then we will have some uh, time for questions and answers. But uh, if you'll have some urgent questions, so feel free to interrupt me and uh, let's begin. So the problem, uh, what is uh, an integration? Integration is some dependency to any external system. Uh, that could be any dependency, any external system as a database, as some queues, some uh, external SDK, some calls to any external server, uh, whatever. Those things are integrations that we have to handle in our application. And the bigger the application, uh, the more those integration do we have, the more external, external system there are that we uh, should work with. And those kind of integrations are usually are handled in the one logical layer, in the service layer. So that lead us to messy code because uh, there are always a situation where we have a big method, very long methods that call some other private methods. And that's lead us to not reusable code. And uh, this not reusable code is all, always lead us to duplications. Because when we need to reuse some functionality, we can't, so we copy paste stuff, and uh, uh, that's that's how we do this. Uh, so uh, this is the diagram, how uh, some typical layer at architecture looks. So uh, on the left side, we have entry points to our applications. So those could be any, any stuff that, uh, uh, that are used to entry. Most of the time is a REST controller, but sometimes it could be like SOAP, WebSocket, uh, and some other stuff. And uh, on the right side, we have a, a service layer with uh, our integrations. So uh, we may have some Postgres SQL, we have um, uh, S3 storage, uh, some maybe SDK. Uh, on our current project, we use Fire Server, and uh, those those things are our integrations. And let's imagine that uh, we'll have um, a project, some online store, when we have a REST controller that needs to create a new product in that store. So how does it look? Yeah, we have a call on our entry point and uh, we have injected a service, a service instance there. And uh, on the same logical level, we handle all those uh, dependencies. So we we handle uh, database stuff there. We query pictures from the S3 bucket. We use our SDK there. And that's uh, lead us to 
uh, to the situation that I described previously with uh, very long methods that, that we, we can't really reuse in, in other places. So in this case, uh, our application, our architecture looks more like the left side with uh, bad modularization, with uh, low cohesion and high coupling. So every service is tied uh, to any other service by its uh, internal implementation. And you cannot uh, uh, extract there some contracts, uh, some interfaces because they are all tied together. What do we need is some kind of right style side when we have some uh, autonomous units uh, that uh, can communicate through the dedicated interfaces and uh, they are not tied together. Uh, that leads us to high cohesion and low coupling. In the consequence, uh, architecture like this, it's uh, pretty much validates everything, uh, including dry keys, solid, and uh, a lot of other principles. But uh, don't get, get me wrong, because uh, uh, we live in the real world and uh, uh, every application can break something, some rules, some principles, including the hexagonal architecture. It is uh, not a silver bullet and uh, you definitely shouldn't use it as a golden hammer that should solve all your problem. It won't, but it definitely can make uh, your life a bit easier in some cases. So the solution, uh, do you remember that slide when, when we have this um, everything included in the one logical service layer. So uh, we we want to try to do something like, uh, more like that. So the uh, now we have like left side and the right side. Uh, in this way, uh, application service is now more like uh, orchestrator or and delegator to those calls from the light, uh, left side. For example, we have a call from the uh, rest endpoint. We have uh, still have injected uh, the application service, but now it doesn't do any dope stuff. Uh, it just delegates uh, calls to those independent modules as uh, called to database stuff, to S3 stuff, and any other. So this one is more like delegator and orchestrator. And uh, now we clearly see that uh, our application can be divided to left and right side. So this is called a hexagonal architecture. And uh, the left part is called API ports and the uh, right part is SPI ports or uh, primary ports and secondary ports. Uh, this, uh, uh, why do we call it ports? Because uh, some people uh, call it uh, the ports and adapters architecture and it's a different name for, for the hexagonal architecture. Okay, so now it's time for the demo. And uh, remember that this is uh, only my personal experience that I got on my current project. And there are a lot of different imp implementations of the hexagonal architecture. And this is only one of them. And uh, think about it more like a specification and um, uh, you have to realize that uh, um, that uh, other people may implement it in different ways. So let's go to the to the presentation. Um, okay, uh, first uh, I'll say a few words about about uh, the program. It is a simulator of an uh, online store. Uh, we have just a few endpoints. Uh, first one is about the products. So we get a list of, uh, 
of all available products in our application. Let's try it. Uh, by the way, do you see my screen well, or should I make it bigger? Okay. Okay, okay for me. Yeah, okay. it's fine. Okay, great. So uh, the the products and endpoints it returns us a list of all available products in our application. Uh, we have uh, some stuff that comes from a database uh, such as ID, name, price, uh, and we have some stuff as a discount. We have a dedicated SDK for the discount, so it comes from the other system. Obviously, I don't have any real SDK. It's just some um some dummy object that returns some data but uh, we we want to think about it as a real server and we have some pictures it's obviously not a real picture but some some dummy bytes but um uh, uh, those pictures comes from the s3 compatible storage and uh, that's how we form a list of available products let's look at another one so we can um, find product details by its id and let's load uh, the id of of this one so now we have a bit different fields we have like new description it comes from a database and uh, we don't have discount for this particular products it's the same as we had here and uh, what is interesting, we have a new field, available amount. This available amount, it comes uh, uh, from the SDK as well. And uh, it shows us how many uh, items do we have on our, uh, on our stock. Uh, and currently we have like the last one, uh, the last one product. And uh, we have like a bit more pictures here. So, Let's create an order for this, this product. Now we, we don't have any orders yet. So let's create one. And we want second ID and amount one. And it's successful, we created it. And let's, let's call this, uh, find the details by ID one more time so now we don't have any any of that product we have zero amount and uh, if we will load this list one more time so this should be gone because it's not available anymore and here we are so we have only those available products okay let's look at the code and how do we do that Uh, so the main thing that we are interested in is uh, this window. So we don't really care how do we do our business logic because it's like dummy logic and uh, it uh, just simulates some, some real world uh, um, work. But uh, what we are really interested in is how do we organize modules and packages there. So let's start from the controller. This is pretty much ordinary REST controller that uh, I'm pretty sure that you have seen a million times. And uh, it doesn't have uh, nothing special. Uh, we have a dependency to our service port and uh, uh, we just call a method on the service port to, to find a product by ID. And let's, let's look at this method. So, uh, this get product by ID method, uh, it comes from an interface. Interface is a product service port. So let's go to the implementation. And implementation of the service port is application service. And application service lives in the application module. Application module, uh, it has purpose of uh, stuff that are related to our framework, to the Spring and uh, etc. 
So this is very similar to, to some regular service, but it has some difference. And uh, what dependencies do we have here is uh, our S3 port, uh, JPA port, SDK port, or house SDK port. So those are our um, uh, SPI or uh, secondary ports. Those are our right side of our application and that port is our left side. So uh, this, these dependencies, uh, obviously, if we use um, JPA port, we expect JPA data to be uh, handled by it. And if you use uh, S3 port, we expect only S3 uh, files managed by its port. And the same as for SDK, we, we don't expect uh, that uh, some warehouse or S3 port knows something about JPA data. And let's look at the, our old method, get product by ID. So first we, um, this, this method doesn't mutate any, any stuff, therefore it's so simple. But uh, if we wanted to create a product, it would be a much more complicated because we first we need to load some stuff, then we should persist some stuff, maybe some updates, delays, and etc. But in this case, we only load data. And how do we do this? So we have JPA product. We get product by E from the JPA port. We have S3 product. We load it from the S3 port. We have discount. We load it from the discount It's the K port, the same as for warehouse product. And uh, let's, oops, something. Not a, uh, Okay, I should restart the server. It doesn't see the breakpoint. Uh, so when we load all of that stuff, uh, we we should merge it to to the one uh, product domain model. So we return product domain model, and if if we will query a, another product. So let's look at those. Uh, see, all of them have uh, the same type. It's product domain model. The product domain model comes from JPA port, from S3 port, from warehouse port, and all of them have the same type. And this is the same type that we returned from the, the main method. And in this mapper, we just merge all of them into the one fully initialized product. But uh, at this point, before the merge, as I said previously, JPA product, it has only JPA related data. So it has name, price, uh, description, but it doesn't have any pictures and it doesn't have uh, um, available in the warehouse field. The same goes for the S3 product. So we don't have any more any, uh, any JPA da data here, but we have pictures. The same for, for the warehouse. So we have only this one field. So the, this uh, product with ID one, we have 24 items on the warehouse. And uh, at this point, we, we merge it. And uh, what is interesting, let's have a look at the product domain model itself. So uh, this, this product domain model, it uh, has every possible state of the domain model that we can have. So it should have every field that a uh, product can have. So we have uh, pictures here, we have uh, JPA stuff here, we have uh, available in warehouse stuff, we have discount here. And the 
one of the purpose of the domain model is to handle its internal stuff and uh, validate its state. So we cannot create or mutate the domain model into the illegal state. For example, uh, this one set available in the warehouse. Uh, we, uh, we want to do some checks here. So uh, if somebody will try to, to set a negative uh, number here into the, this field, we will throw an uh, exception because this is illegal uh, state for our application and we, we shouldn't do this. The same uh, for apply discount method. We, we are encouraged to create such methods here because the main model is it shouldn't be anemic. Uh, we should have uh, some behavior here and behavior that means that we should create a new methods here and uh, it's not like a DTO when we have only getters and setters so uh, it's uh, totally fine and we want to have a lot, as much as possible methods here because they are completely reusable in any place of our application and Speaking about the domain model, where it lives, it lives in the domain uh, model module, and uh, domain module is uh, it should be clear from any any other external dependencies, including framework, JPA stuff, and etc. Uh, have you noticed that we we don't have any any notations here uh, except? of Lombok, of course, but uh, we, we this domain model is uh, clear. It's just pure Java code. We don't have any any stuff here that uh, that we are dependent on. And uh, let's look at the, the POM of the uh, domain module. It's a Maven domain module. And uh, what dependencies do we have here? It's uh, all of them are here. So we have a Lombok, we have uh, two libraries of uh, Apache uh, for some convenience, and we have a few test dependencies for um, JUnit, and that's it. Uh, in the perfect world, you would want to have zero of them, but uh, we re live in the real world and um, uh, it's some kind of convenience to to use those stuff, but uh, they are not uh, framework related stuff. We don't use like sprint dependencies here, so it's more or less fine to have to have them here. But uh, we should try to do as less as possible um, dependencies uh, to the domain model because it's a clean core of our application and we should keep it clean. We should uh, make it reusable, as much reusable as possible. So for the reusable reusability, we don't need some integrations done in this level. And uh, what else do we have in the domain module is ports. And we have here API and SPI ports, the same interfaces that we already seen. So API ports is our product service port that we have implementation of uh, product application service. And we have secondary ports. Uh, uh, those are the same ports that our, uh, our primary port is dependent on. So now, Let's go deeper into one of the one of the adapters. So we have a product GPA port. This stuff, as you remember, it should load uh, uh, all GPA data that we store in our database. And this is the same interface interface uh, that lives in the domain model. And uh, implementation of that interface is product JPA adapter. Product JPA adapter is, uh, it lives in the adapter level. So uh, now we, we have uh, any annotations that we need for this specific technology. 
So uh, if you have JPA stuff, so obviously we will add to our POM XML of adapter module every possible dependency that we need. So here we have uh, Sprint Boot Starter JPA and uh, every other stuff that we need, uh, including the database we use H2 database. So let's let's take a look. Uh, we we have uh, um, dependency on the product repository. Product repository is uh, um, this the vanilla GPA repository, and uh, obviously this repository will return us a entity, JPA entity. But in this level, we want to return a product domain model. And how do we do this? We just load a JPA entity from the repository, and then we map it uh, to the domain model through the mapper. What is the mapper? Is um, another interface we use a mapstruct. Uh, mapstruct is a library that uh, allows us to do uh, very convenient mappers. So we should define only the interface. And uh, if some uh, custom mapping are needed, we provide them by annotations. And it can generate us code like this. So all those getters and setters uh, are hidden from us. They still exist in the generated uh, folder, but uh, it uh, we don't have it uh, in our adapters. So in this way, our adapters can be uh, as thin as possible. So we have like only one line and everything is done under this one line. So this, uh, this kind of cool stuff for it. And let's go back to place where we call it. So we executed a call from JPA. Let's have a look about uh, this S3 port. So we load pictures by, uh, by this product domain model. It's the same old interface, interface that lives in the uh, domain module. It's a secondary adapter. We have implementation of uh, uh, of of the port is uh, product S3 adapter. It lives in the same adapter level. So now we are going here, and in this level, uh, every every adapter, every level of this uh, of those logical modules can have its own config. So we may have JPA config for JPA stuff. They are located in this package and we have S3 config for uh, uh, S3 compatible storages here. But uh, as I said, it's only a dummy, dummy config. So it uh, it is not real S3 client, but uh, if we had one, we would just add a new dependency to our adapter POM and e we would use it here. And the same thing, uh, it return us uh, bytes from the, from the client and we should convert those bytes and make them product domain models. So uh, the other layers would know of what the data it is because um, bytes is a primitive. So we don't need uh, any dependencies for it. But imagine if we uh, would return some, uh, some object from our uh, our library, some third party uh, dependency or, or whatever. So we would need to convert that uh, foreign object into our uh, application core object. So we would need to convert it to the domain model, the uh, stuff that we do through the mapper. So every, every adapter, adapter has its own mapper and we just map those stuff to the to the domain model object, and uh, in this uh, part, we uh, when we have those uh, all those needed partially initialized objects, domain models, uh, we need to merge them into the one fully initialized domain model object. So we use another 
mapper. Uh, it's application uh, service mapper. And what it does, we, it accepts uh, uh, the, all of those objects and some fields uh, we take from the JPA uh, objects, uh, some fields as pictures can provide a three object and some fields as available in the warehouse provides warehouse product. So uh, this, this uh, is the generated implementation. It does all those getter setters for us. So the application service would be very clean and uh, tidy. And uh, about those methods that uh, we use in the, we create in the domain model, we are strongly encouraged to, uh, to use them in any place that we want. So those methods are really reusable. And uh, if we can use them, we, we should use them. So in this way, we apply a discount for, for the product. Uh, and uh, when we, we are ready with the, our response, uh, we came here to the controller. And uh, at that point, we just want to map uh, the domain model into the DTO. So we use another mapper for that. And uh, uh, one more thing about our packages. Uh, as you may notice, uh, we have uh, feature uh, organized packages. So uh, we don't do stuff like that. Uh, we create a, a controller package and every controller that we have, we put into the one package, every repository we put into the other package. We don't do this. We do a bit different. Uh, we have a feature, a product. So every related stuff to the product, uh, comes to that package. For, for example, we, we may have some entities uh, for the product. We have mappers, we have a GPA repository. Uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that it should be only one entity in our project. We have quite a lot of, of them for, for the feature. And uh, for example, in this case, uh, if we would uh, have a discount uh, handled by JPA port, not by uh, that uh, SDK, we would put a uh, discount entity here in this, uh, in this um, package. So, okay, this is it with the code. Let's, uh, let's have a look about the tests and uh, as you, as you saw, all those uh, uh, adapters are autonomous units. And uh, so every, uh, every thing we can test separately. Uh, I have only a test for JPA and REST because uh, the rest of them are uh, not, real, uh, not real clusters, just dummies with hooks. Uh, but if we, uh, I would have a, S3 storage, I would have another one package for testing S3 data there. So uh, the rest, it, uh, it should have, uh, um, we can do controller tests there. And obviously every mapper on every layer has its own mapper test. It's uh, quite important to know that uh, mappers are not broken and everything works, uh, works as we intended. And the same goes for JPA. We, we can create uh, as much JPA test as we want and we test only JPA data in, in this uh, in those tests. The same, we have JPA mapper tests, so we make sure that the entity is mapped correctly. Uh, for the domain uh, module, we also have tests. Uh, remember those methods as apply discount. So all those methods are definitely uh, worth testing and we want to have some tests for them. So we, we have a test for, for those domain model me methods. 
And the most interesting part is the application layer. Uh, as I told you, we have um, we have tests for um, for uh, application service, and uh, those tests uh, are pretty uh, pretty ordinary. But we also have something like this. Uh, we have an arc unit library, and arc unit is those are probably the most important tests in our application. Um, I I cannot stress enough how important is it. So let me demonstrate uh, what it does. So imagine we go back to our application service and uh, we do something like this. Uh, we have a product entity and doesn't matter what we want to do with this. Uh, it's already wrong because uh, JPA entity should be managed by the JPA port. And now we have dependency directly to the JPA related stuff, uh, but we, we go over the JPA ports and it's wrong, but Java completely allows us to do such thing because if you will look at the uh form of the application module we have dependency to the domain and to the adapter uh, layers and uh, uh, every class that we have uh, in the adapter we have here the same goes from uh, for dto s3 stuff and so on so this stuff is completely wrong and we shouldn't do this and uh, this application architecture test really helps because when we run it, it will immediately tell us that uh, uh, we violated that uh, hexagonal arc rule and it should fail. Okay, it's, it's failed because uh, it's illegal thing to use uh, uh, to use entity in the um, in the application service layer so we don't do stuff like this and uh, uh, I have some more tests here and uh, in our uh, our project uh, we have like 20 of, of those rules and um, uh, we have a confluence page where we have a custom project conventions where we decide how do we do stuff and we try to cover every convention by this uh, architecture test if it's possible so it uh, give us a really great benefit because when we do a merge request uh, the uh, guy who does a review doesn't need to check every single line yeah uh, he, he can check only the pipeline and if uh, pipeline is red uh, that's mean that some tests are broken and those tests can uh, um, do those self checks and the developer knows immediately that something is broken and something should be fixed so those are uh, i cannot stress it enough how how good are they Okay, so this is uh, it about the test. And um, uh, I think it's uh, it's everything that I wanted to show you with this uh, demo. And let's go back to, to our presentation. Okay, so a few words about a uh, theoretical aspect. So uh, why this architecture is called a hexagonal? So as you can see, we have a clean application core in the middle and that core is used by 
some uh, primary adapters that is um, used by uh, external clients, uh, those entry points to our, our application. And uh, on the right side, we have adapters that are implementations of the ports, and those adapters uh, use some external systems. So when you draw a diagram, it looks more like a hexagon. Uh, so uh, you can come from every side from the left and uh, come out from every side on the right. So it looks a bit like a hexagon. So uh, and this one is, uh, uh, I really like this picture because it uh, shows us uh, this division between uh, left part and the right part. So in the middle, we have application core and the left side is telling our application what to do, what do we gonna do? And the right part uh, is told by application core uh, how to do this. So this part, uh, like send a task, uh, do find me a product by ID, and that part is responsible for actually finding it in, in the dedicated adapters. So uh, this is uh, materials that uh, are really useful. First one is a book, uh, it's called The Clean Architecture. It is written by uh, Robert Martin. And uh, this is the origin of the hexagonal and onion architecture. So if you want to check it, it's definitely worth reading. Uh, at least uh, you can skip like uh, everything uh, up to the part uh, of the clean architecture. So it's a really good book. And those links are links uh, that uh, uh, when we started the project, uh, we did uh, a lot of research and uh, we saved those links to our Confluence page. So when uh, now we have a new guide to our team and we need to do onboarding, first thing that we do is sending that page to, to the guy and uh, um, it helps uh, people to understand the purpose and uh, the hexagonal architecture and uh, how to do this and uh, what tasks uh, should it solve, what problems should it solve and uh, so on. And uh, uh, one of them, this one is, um, very good example of domain services. Uh, we don't have domain services and I didn't show you them. Uh, but uh, the thing is, uh, imagine that you want to move your application service into the domain module. So first thing you, you must do it is uh, delete all of framework related stuff from there uh, as, um, as uh, annotations. So in this way, um, the application service would be still more or less uh, like it was before, but uh, without any, any external dependencies. And uh, it would be a clean Java class that uh, we would uh, create as a bin manually. And in this way, uh, we, we would have a bigger application core. We would have a bigger domain model and those stuff would be more reusable, but uh, it has a cost. Um, for example, uh, if we want to use a transactional annotation, we can do this because the uh, domain model doesn't know about the, those annotations. So in this way, we would uh, have the situation where we need uh, domain uh, services and application services. So, and uh, application service would be just delegate call to the domain service, but uh, with additional annotations and some stuff. So we, we don't really need it in our current project. So we decided to go with only application services. Uh, what tools are uh, uh, 
uh, are we using uh, to make our life easier? First one is a map struct. You've seen it a lot. Uh, it's, uh, it makes our adapters uh, thinner and cleaner. And we don't have tons of getters and setters in our adapter services. And uh, it, uh, it makes uh, our code clean and tidy. And ArcUnit is uh, another one great library that we use in. And uh, as I said, is probably the most important test in our application. And the last one is Lombok. I know that some people don't like Lombok. It's considered a hack, but um, uh, it allows us to make our uh, domain models uh, more cleaner. We don't have boilerplate code there. We don't have those getter setters. And if we have custom methods as uh, apply discount, it's uh, very easy to spot because uh, we have only two methods there and not of uh, 15. And the conclusion. So uh, what are the pros of cleaner, uh, of uh, hexagonal architecture? It is a clean architecture. It, the core is free from any framework and from any external dependency. And you, uh, you can migrate your project, let's say in 10 years, uh, the spring is gone and uh, a new great framework uh, uh, on the horizon and you want to migrate to, to that new framework. It's quite uh, easy. Easy. At least it's much easier to do as with uh, traditional layered architecture. And uh, implementation can be swapped at any moment. Uh, that means that, for example, we have now uh, like a strict compatible storage and in some day we want to, to use some different storage. For example, we want to use like uh, Google Cloud or any other provider. So. Uh, all we need to do is implement another uh, adapter and that's it. The whole application remains the, the same. The uh, port, which is an uh, interface, is robust thing. It uh, shouldn't change at all. So we change only uh, the implementation and the contracts remain the same. And uh, that's how it's much easier to reuse and much easier to test because every adapter is isolated autonomous unit that uh, uh, that is parked on each uh, logical module. And that's how we achieve uh, low coupling and how cohesion, as we talked previously. And uh, after all this, all those stuff, it uh, improves the quality and durability and maintainability of the application. But I'm not gonna lie, it comes from the cost. And uh, its first one is uh, the architecture is complicated. Uh, it requires a more mature team and uh, you have to spend some time for onboarding. And uh, at the end, uh, too many members. Uh, in the traditional layered architecture, you have only one layer of mapper. And uh, you, you have just to map a DTO to the entity and backwards. But uh, here you have map uh, uh, JPA stuff to the domain model, then you have to merge those uh, uh, models uh, into the one domain model. Uh, and at the end, you have uh, map uh, domain model into the DTO or any other object. So uh, every, every adapter has its own mappers and uh, there are really too many of them. So this, this is the consequence and uh, when to use it. So if you have a lot of uh, integrations uh, and if your domain model is big and uh, you have complication, uh, complicated business logic, so it's definitely the cases for the hexagonal architecture and it's uh, a bit easier to uh, manage this project uh, and split tasks uh, between a team, especially if you have a big team. But a uh, big project alone, uh, alone it doesn't mean that uh, you have to use it. So you should choose carefully. 
and where not to use it is uh, when you have a very simple CRUD application or uh, you have some simple architecture without uh, any a lot of integrations, uh, it doesn't make sense to use it if you are going to use only a database and it's all. So it's not the case for it and uh, you will, um, it's better to go to with the uh, layered architecture. Okay, so this is it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I left a link to the source code with uh, that project. Uh, you can play with it if you want. And in the readme, uh, there is a link for this presentation in case if you are interested at in those links to those articles. And uh, now I believe we still have some time for questions if you have. I have a question, basically regarding why do we need to have single model that actually will be invalid for each of the port? Um, it's it not would be invalid. Uh, think about it as for uh, some bounded context. So in case of JPA uh model it is valid but it's valid only for uh, the scope of jpa port uh if you have every every data there it's fine to to have such model the same goes for s3 uh, s3 ports so if you have only only pictures it's completely fine but uh, we need to uh, have a, a common model that uh, every possible layer and every possible adapter uh, can be dependent on. And this is the domain model. So it uh, should be shared across the application. And if you want to, uh, to transfer some data, so this is uh, kind of as a DTO, but uh, with some extra stuff as it's not uh, anemic. So you you do some behavioral stuff there and it should have uh, those, those methods. Okay, and so how it's better to share this common model instead of, for example, for image port to provide us with image source model, something like that. So, and also re remove uh, dependency on, for example, like let's say G like GPA or other concrete like um, service and just provide an interface to the service as a, like, for example, repo or something like that. So then we can at the, at the eye level inject port, like specific implementation of that port, like whether it would be a source from the GPA or other because we we interested in getting data like the model so we don't want to have uh, in the application layer actually to know which service we use underneath so i don't actually see how it would how it would benefit with growing and growing shared model instead of having like the small models that represent each port and that port can be interchanged with mock topic implementation with real implementation whatsoever at DI level. Uh, yeah, I I think I got you. Uh, so uh, this this also may be a case. So when you have um, uh, some dedicated models for. Uh, uh for pictures uh, for example in this case uh, we we could just uh, uh just uh, return uh bytes because those those bytes are um it's uh, it those comes from java and uh, or we can do some value object and it would be fine uh to do this but uh i'm sorry i'm i will interrupt you i'm not telling uh, saying about expose any internal like value that is like related to specific implementation i'm talking about for example to create dedicated yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Level, like have product product domain model have a picture 
domain model that will have, for example, a string. And it will yeah. be a string for each of the implementations, not, not the bytes, for example. We will still have mapping to, to happen in order to provide this model. But on the yeah. higher level, we will have an ability to actually work with the types and make sure that those types were used correctly. Because if we, we can easily swap out, even in, in the mapper functionality, which you have in the previous method, you can swap out those, uh, like you just can miss an order of parameters. And because they have the same time, you just will end up with wrong uh, final model. Because yep. you're yep. able to do that. Yep, yep, uh, I I agree with you. And uh, what I was talking about here, yep, those value objects would live here. Or, uh, uh, for example, we have uh, one case with uh, with the discount. So uh, those could be uh, plenty of methods like that, uh, uh, classes like that. And those classes has a right to live, and uh, we we would use them. Uh, them at this level so uh, yeah uh, i i agree with you so uh, we it's a not really good thing because all of them has the same uh the same uh the same type so in this one i just wanted to uh, with uh, the discount, I wanted to show how um, how can we use uh, this method here. And for example, uh, uh, it makes sense to to pass it this discount to the method and execute this method directly in the mapper. And uh, uh, you you can go both ways. So whether it but, suits you. But then, like. The, the dependency here is applying discount means that we need to produce some kind of new entity. Otherwise, like we construct, so so like we have an object that consists of different parts, and then we like uh, apply something on top of that. But discount can be part of that already, right? Or or, or it could provide and like discounted product model, so we we can work with it as already processed data. I'm just saying like the main concern here is that we have a lot of same types, models of same type that are incomplete and their own, and then you combine them. And then you combine them in that way that you are actually able to mistype it. So human error like is high here. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I agree, it's uh, a cons of uh, this approach, but uh, in the other hand, uh, if you create a, a dedicated uh, object for every port, uh, you would end up uh, to the situation when uh, you don't uh, don't really have those, um, those stuff, um, um, how to say it, um, uh, you 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 won't have a uh, one single source of true like a uh, product domain model that uh, has uh, a repossible value but uh, i i understand you you can go both way because uh, this uh, this way has has those drawbacks Maybe some other questions. Maybe this question. And thank you for the presentation. Uh, I want to understand what was the main reason to decide uh, to implement this uh, hexagonal architecture in Geo project. Maybe it was uh, some decision in the future to reuse domain or maybe something else. Maybe 
to divide the uh, domain object into some separate uh, services. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let me open the slide. So um, we uh, we had, uh, uh, as I said, uh, we uh, our project, we started it from the scratch and uh, we already knew that we will have a lot of integrations. Uh, although we have a, a relatively simple uh, domain model in case of, uh, if you speak about uh, the behavior, we don't have a lot of uh, methods there, but it's uh, quite big. And we have uh, a, a lot of integrations, um, maybe not that much as, as here, but we have, uh, on the left side, currently we have only REST, but uh, we we are ready to, to provide a fire server. So there would be uh, two of them there. But on the right side, we have we have a Postgres SQL database. We have uh, S3 storage for storing files. We have a fire server uh, that we already calling to external systems. And we have SDK that the uh, client provide us to, to other uh, other systems. So we, we knew this uh, at the beginning and uh, we wanted to decide uh, how how could we handle it first thing uh, we tried uh, to do a poc with uh, layered architecture and it looked like uh, uh, like more like uh, on this slide so everything is uh, uh, related on the the same logical service layer and uh, it uh, it would quite uh, it was quite a mess so next uh, next we decided to our uh, hexagonal architecture and uh, we have been working with it for uh, one point and a half years and uh, it's it sh looks like quite robust thing and uh, we quite happy that we chose it Okay, thank you for, for the answer, but uh, people need to know that uh, if they will have the maybe bigger domain uh, and it will grow, it will have a business logic and the cost of the production with hexagonal architecture will rise very, very fast. So it can be a problem if you only need uh, this integration uh, it may not be the the reason to choose hexagonal architecture if yep. you will know that you want to divide the domain if you will have this big amount of domain object it, it, and you know that you will go into some uh, separate uh, services in the future in with, with some a doctor it will it, it can be a good reason uh yeah yeah i, I agree uh, as i said that uh, if uh, if you don't have uh, those stuff that you know that uh, you need uh, to handle a lot of integration it would be a overkill and uh, the cost of the project would be higher and uh, but uh, if you know it uh, from the beginning so in this case, uh, happens completely opposite. So the cost of application would be lower because uh, you will save um, uh, a lot of uh, time in the future when you will uh, your application will uh, grow and you will have a lot of modules. It would be much easier to handle them than it uh, um, it would be with the uh, layered architecture. Thank you. Okay, maybe someone else. Yeah, hello, probably one more question. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And uh, the question is why we uh, have uh, 
adapter dependency on application level since we on domain level we have uh, all inter required interfaces and we might use them uh, in application level and then the implementations will be binded by uh, spring and uh, why we uh, have adapter uh, dependency on the application level we can avoid it right or no uh So we have application module, yeah. yeah. And why in POM we should have adapter dependency? Uh, because uh, application uh, module is module that uh, is handled by Spring. So in this way, uh, we um, uh, it's fra yeah. framework related stuff. So if we, if we build uh okay the, there is no drawer here. yeah right i see i see i see that you you don't have separate module for the boot uh and, and in case if you will uh split a separate boot module uh, you will have uh, an ability to uh, so you will uh, have in boot module for mm -hmm. example all of the dependencies and in that case you will not uh have the dependency on adapter in application level yep yep mm -hmm. true yeah, and then these uh, ARC uh, unit tests uh, will not be needed, I think. Mm, yeah, th there is uh, some other ways to to handle this uh, problem that uh, you you have uh, like uh, inject like some other stuff, uh, some wrong stuff to the uh, wrong levels. But the ARC unit is not not just about that. So it make um, uh, you can create a rule, for example, that uh, classes in uh, specific package should have some prefix or some suffix, and uh, this is a, a really cool way to to handle uh, not only the hexagonal architecture but uh, to enforce your custom conventions in the project. So this one is uh, mm, it's still needed arc unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to to have your uh, code cleaner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Okay, no questions. One more question: Did uh, uh, you try to use uh, Java nine uh, module system? Uh, we haven't tried it here, but uh, I know that some people. Uh, uh, do this and uh, some people have more uh, maven modules than we have we have only three of them and they this are some other ways to do this thank you okay guys Maybe someone else have questions. No questions, yes. <laughs>